Welcome to another episode of Nathan Builds Robots. Today we'll be looking at this Ender 3S1. This is actually the pro version of the Ender 3S1, so it comes with a couple of extra features. Everything in here is packaged nearly identically to the regular Ender 3S1. Two of the main differences are right here, the all metal hot end and this touch screen, which replaces the non touch screen interface used by the regular Ender 3S1. If we look a little deeper into the box here, we can see another small difference on the Ender 3S1 Pro, and that's this light bar across the top of the frame. This will help you see what you're printing a little bit better. And here's the fully assembled base. Let's pull this out of the box and take a closer look at it. Both of the Ender 3S1s come stock with a flexible steel heated build tray. This one is PEI coated. If you have the Ender 3S1 and you don't like that polycarbonate build surface, you can easily replace it with your own PEI sheet. The prints are much easier to remove and it's just a much more hassle-free printing experience. This base portion of the machine feels a little bit lighter on the Ender 3S1 Pro and that might have to do with this new injection molded plastic base. The underside of the machine is still sheet metal. It looks like the motherboard has slightly better ventilation too. I won't bother opening this up because everything on the inside should be pretty much the same as the old model. All right, let's put this thing together. This machine has the same quick and easy assembly that the original Ender 3S1 has. Basically, you just take the fully assembled base and put the fully assembled top piece onto it. Then there's four screws that you need to bolt in. And my favorite assembly tip whenever you're putting one of these 3D printers together is to just take it and pull it off the edge of the table that you're working on. And then you can secure those bolts nice and easily without having to hold anything in position. Let's take a closer look at this extruder and hot end assembly because this is one of the major differences between the S1 and the S1 Pro. This whole hot end assembly has been upgraded to work with higher temperatures. They've installed a high temperature thermistor, which can go over 300 degrees Celsius, and a higher wattage heater cartridge. And an upgrade that I'm very glad to see is this all metal heat break. They changed the extruder housing to an aluminum construction instead of an injection molded nylon construction like on the previous model. It feels a little more premium and it looks nicer. I guess it'll help dissipate heat a little better. One of the major deficiencies of the old Ender 3S1 is their use of a really small part cooling fan. You can see it right here. And the Pro model uses the same tiny part cooling fan that I think is insufficient for the job. I've designed a couple bolt-on fan shrouds that you can just attach to the side of this to upgrade your part cooling capabilities. So check those videos out if you want to boost your print speeds and part cooling. And it looks like they're using the same breakout board to facilitate all the connections between the main board and the hot end. I've actually burnt out part of this PCB because the traces on this are super tiny. They're sized for the amount of current that needs to run these fans. But the thing is, if you cause a momentary short, it makes this thing roast. Oh god, no, what the f- what just happened? So if you're messing around with the fans on this thing, you gotta be really careful because you might fry this part of your board, or it might even fry something back on the main board. In my other videos, I show you how to step the voltage down in a safe way. You just want to make sure that you never short the wires together. Speaking of shorting wires together, you want to inspect these wires here, because if these touch, it's going to cause some arcing, possibly a fire. You can see these wires can become exposed really easily. So just inspect this and make sure that they aren't touching before you power everything up. So let's just put this together over here. All you have to do is thread these screws in. Next, I'm going to bolt this screen onto the side here. This spool holder just kind of snaps on. Pretty easy. I'm actually not a big fan of this design because on my Ender 3S1, I actually broke mine. So it's kind of, you know falling apart a little bit. With the mechanical build complete, I just need to plug all the wires in. So down here, I'm gonna plug in the screen. Around back, I'm gonna plug in the two Z-direction stepper motors. Don't forget to flip your power supply to the correct setting. So I'm gonna switch that to 110. I'm gonna bring up this wiring harness that comes from under the machine. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my stepper motor and I'll plug in the limit switch. Then up at the top, I've got my filament runout detector. Then you're gonna to wanna to plug in this connector that powers everything on the hot end. Pull these two tabs apart, plug in the connector just like this. When you push it down, those tabs should come and clamp onto the cable there. This connector will power the light, and then this one powers the filament runout detector. Now I just need to plug in the power cable here. Some things never change. This machine isn't quite ready to print right out the box. You can see I can move this around a little bit. Now the S1 has this nice low profile design, but it makes these eccentric nuts a little bit harder to reach. Hmm, what the hell? There's actually a bolt that's in the way here. The problem with this bolt is that it keeps me from getting access to that V-groove wheel from this angle. 
And that's so tight where it's to the point where if you have really big hands, you're not going to be able to get in there and do this stuff. So it might be necessary to unthread the bed leveling knobs all the way and then take this top off. Then you'll be able to more easily get the wrench in under here and get the bed tension just right. All right, next I'm going to adjust my belt tension. So you can just strum the back like a guitar string. This Ender 3S1 comes with a nice little drawer so you can put away all your spare parts and tools. Just close it and forget about everything that's in there. If you're using a PEI build surface, you should never need to use a spatula. So you might as well just throw this away. It's pretty common for printer manufacturers to send you a spool of filament so you can test the machine out. But the stuff that Creality provides is pretty stinky and it's just kind of garbage overall. So if I were you, I'd just buy a proper roll of filament. This filament I'm using today is from Tech Bears. They make really cheap filament that's exceptional quality. I've bought like six spools of this stuff. What I like about this Tech Bears filament is that it's really cheap. They're not sponsoring this video or anything, I just like it. So I'll leave links to it in the description below. All right, so I've got the SD card here. I'm ready to turn this thing on. And let's see, our light up at the top works really great. That's actually nice. This could be really handy for filming. Anyways, let's get to printing. So we've got our SD card plugged in here and we'll run our bed leveling procedure. So just through the touch screen, I can access a leveling menu and it's gonna go ahead and come down and touch the build surface. I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing here, but it's just gonna go ahead and probe a bunch of points on the bed. Oof, it actually just got caught right here on the edge of the stepper motor. It just kind of wants to droop over and get caught on the stepper motor here. Almost ripped a little chunk of the cable out right there. So it's definitely gonna be a problem if I don't do something to get this pushed over to the other side. The instructions on the menu aren't super clear as to what everything does. So you'll probably have to read the instruction manual to get this bed level set up correctly. But I have a strict no reading the manual policy on this channel. So I'm just gonna let it do this and then I'm gonna try and print some stuff. It says it's at 13.2 millimeters but it's touching the bed. If I go down, <laughs> what the? There's some little firmware bugs in here that they probably need to work out. We'll probably get some open source community firmware that's gonna be better than this anyways. So I've went ahead and inserted the SD card that came with the machine. I'm gonna go ahead and print cat. The quality is looking really good right now, but that's to be expected since the Ender 3S1 already had excellent print quality. This machine, since it's not really any different, it should produce about the same results. So this cat print just finished up. Quality is looking excellent. There's a tiny bit of stringing on this model, but it's the kind of stringing that you can brush away really easily. And now everything looks pretty good. So this thing is a bit louder than the standard Ender 3 S1. The Pro Edition has this plastic base. And the thing about a plastic bass is it has a kind of acoustic signature, kind of like an acoustic guitar. You've got this large cavity with a material that's kind of soft like wood. It'll resonate and it just amplifies the noises from the motors. I don't know if there's any way to fix this. This is just kind of built into the frame of this machine. This print profile is a little bit slower, but it's geared towards having excellent quality. We'll take a closer look at this later during a print quality assessment. All right, next up I'm going to be testing out some carbon fiber filament. This prints at 260 degrees Celsius. So this is at the upper limits of what you could do on a regular Ender 3S1. I'm gonna be printing this on a steel sheet with some blue painter's tape and glue stick. And uh, that should get pretty good adhesion results. The main thing that wears the nozzle down is when it drags across the top of a model when it's printing on the same layer. So if you enable a Z-hop, it basically picks the nozzle up a little bit and then moves it over the top and then puts it back down whenever it does a retraction. And this will help reduce the amount of wear that the nozzle receives when you're printing carbon fiber nylon. Oof. This stepper motor in the back is pretty hot. I'm going to get a temperature on it. It's running at 65 degrees Celsius. All the other stepper motors are at 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. Removing the heat break from the Ender 3S1 is quite easy. All you have to do is take off the extruder as I just did. Just loosen up this set screw. Now I'm just going to remove the silicone sock. On the Ender 3s you have two additional screws that hold the heater block in. With those two screws removed, 
I can pull the heater block out. There's also some filament still loaded in here, so I'm going to snip that and pull it out the other end. In their marketing material, they claim this is a titanium alloy heat break. It looks like a pretty basic design. We'll see if I can just pry it off here. There we go. I'm not planning on reusing this nozzle, so it doesn't matter to me if I mar it up a little bit. But if you wanted to keep it, I would recommend heating everything up and loosening it gently. At this point, I'm going to heat up the heater block so that I can remove the heat break. But it kind of looks like this heat break was glued in place. I really hope that's not the case. If you look in the bottom side, there's no plastic in the threads or on the end of the heat break. So that tells me that what I'm seeing up at the top there isn't just melted plastic that seeped out the top. I think they might have actually glued this together. The Ender 3 is the reigning champ of budget 3D printers, and that's for good reason. They get great print quality right out of the box, they have a highly modular design that's easy to upgrade and repair, and they have massive market adoption, meaning that community support and aftermarket mods are readily available. The Sprite extruder takes print quality and modularity to the next level. Upgrading and modifying your machine used to take hours because even simple changes like replacing a heater cartridge meant that you had to pull everything apart, mess with the motherboard, rebuild the wiring harness, and then pray that you didn't mess anything up because if you did, you'd be at it for another two plus hours trying to fix it. Now the whole extruder and hot end assembly can be swapped out in less than a minute thanks to its smart use of connectors. But since these two machines have so much in common, why would you pay $100 more for this one? Well for starters, you get this nice little light up top which is extremely well built and makes it really easy to see what's going on. The touch screen lets you change a bunch of advanced settings like the acceleration, jerk, steps per millimeter, and heater PID values. However, there's a couple changes that in my opinion aren't so pro. What's going on with this plastic base? It's louder, lighter, and cheaper to produce, so it really seems to be a cost cutting measure more than anything. I'm not opposed to that, but why introduce it on the more expensive model? It comes with a marginal noise increase, which a lot of people might not notice, but I'm a stickler about noise, so it bugs me. And the main selling point of this machine, the high temperature hot end, is a bit strange in context with the rest of the build. Well, the main material that people are going to want to print in the 250 to 300 degrees Celsius range are ABS and carbon fiber reinforced nylon. ABS is prone to warping and should be printed in a heated enclosure and carbon reinforced plastics should be printed with a hardened steel nozzle. So this printer, as it's designed and shipped, is not capable of reliably printing either of these materials, making it seem like an incomplete package. Essentially, you have to stick with PLA and PETG, so what's the point in paying extra for the Pro model? I'd like to see Creality provide a steel nozzle as the included spare. That way, you could start printing with at least one professional grade material with what's included in the box. The second thing that bugs me about this hot end is that the thermistor and heat brake are glued in place. By gluing this assembly together, you're eliminating a point of failure, which could make the machine more reliable, but you now have to treat the whole hot end as one module that is designed to be thrown out and replaced as a unit. This is a step backwards in serviceability, which, in my opinion, contradicts the main philosophy of the Ender 3. I also had a tiny amount of stringing on these tests compared to what I saw on the non-pro Ender 3 S1. I tried changing the retraction settings, but I couldn't completely eliminate the stringing, so I wanted to swap the heat breakout to see if that would help, and we all know how that turned out. If you have experience with the S1 Pro, let me know in the comments if you've seen this stringing too. Also, the overhang performance is good, but not great. And that comes down to the tiny part cooling fan on this machine. But don't worry, I've got you covered. I've designed a bunch of fan ducts that you can bolt onto the side of this machine and greatly increase the part cooling capabilities. Head over to my Patreon where I've taken a massive dump. I mean, I've just dropped a bunch of new files and fan ducts that are super easy to install. Now of all the things I've talked about in this video, there's one huge problem that I haven't even touched on yet. And it's so easy to fix. It's that you've watched this entire video and you haven't subscribed to my channel. I mean, I might have broken this heat break, but you're breaking my heart right now. I still think the S1 and the S1 Pro are outstanding printers, but I don't think the Pro is worth the extra $100. You'd be much better off putting that $100 towards upgrades that actually improve the performance of your 3D printer. Or you could try out an Ender 3 S1 Plus, which looks like it's based off the Ender 3 S1, but comes with a larger 300 millimeters cubed build volume. I'll leave links to all three printers in the description below. I want to give a huge shout out to Pergear for sending me this printer for testing and review. They sell a wide range of 3D printers and 3D printer accessories, so check them out using the links in the video description. 
and stay tuned for more videos where I'll be taking this printer to the next level. And as always, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Mm.